Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome again to Grand Rounds. Uh, this is our second live stream only Grand Rounds. Uh, I hope you are all safe and sound at home and uh, managing to get into a routine and trying to stay productive and healthy through all of this. It's really my pleasure to, today to introduce one of our own, Dr. Lauren Moran, who's going to be speaking with us on the risk of psychosis with amphetamine versus methylphenidate in adolescents and young adults with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Dr. Moran is an assistant professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and a psychiatrist here at McLean Hospital in the Division of Psychotic Disorders. After graduating from Columbia College, she received her MD from Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, where she also completed her psychiatry residency training. Following residency, she did a research, she was a research fellow at the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center and the Center of Addiction Medicine at Mass General Hospital. She's been the recipient of Young Investigator Awards from the Department of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, the DuPont Warren Fellowship, the Society of Biological Psychiatry, the International Congress on Schizophrenia Research, and the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation, also known as NARSAB. As attending psychiatrist on the Schizophrenia and Bipolar Disorders Inpatient Unit, um, her clinical observations of patients presenting with a first episode of psychosis or mania in the context of amphetamine use motivated her to shift her focus of research to studying the risk of psychosis and mania with prescription stimulant use, utilizing big data sources such as electronic health records and administrative claims data. She currently holds a K-23 award from the National Institute of Mental Health entitled Risk of Psychosis with Prescription Stimulants. The findings she's going to present today in Grand Rounds were recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, and I welcome to the podium uh, Dr. Moran. Thank you. Um, so I, I have no disclosures. And really, the objectives today are going to be to identify prescribing trends of methylphenidate and amphetamines in adolescents and young adults with attention deficit disorder, to um, describe the relative risk of psychosis in new users of methylphenidate and amphetamines, and to describe the relative risk by provider type. So stimulants are um, very commonly used, and the use of them is, has been increasing. In 2016, there was uh, approximately 6 million children between the ages of 4 and 17 who were diagnosed at some point with attention deficit disorder. Um, mixed um, amphetamine salts are the most commonly abused drug by high school seniors, and approximately 16 adults reported past year use of stimulants in the year 2016, of whom 5 million reported misusing them. Um, in response to spontaneous warnings of psychosis and mania, the FDA conducted a review of randomized controlled trials of all stimulants in, in 2006. Um, they found uh, that there were 11 psychotic events, notably all in the stimulant arms, with none in the placebo arms. Um, but these were short trials. The median duration of treatment was only 23 days. But as a result of this review, they added a, they changed the stimulant labels in 2007 and said that stimulants can cause treatment emergent psychosis or mania in patients with no prior history. And despite the high prevalence of the use of these medications, there is, before this study, no comparative, stu no comparative studies of the risk of psychosis or mania. Um, so all stimulants have in common that they inhibit the dopamine transporter, and they also cause phasic dopamine release. Um, amphetamine, there are subtle differences, though. Amphetamine is more of a releaser, and it has a fourfold increased release of dopamine compared to methylphenidate, whereas methylphenidate is a more potent um, inhibitor, so it's a blocker. Now, when we look at studies um, like nuclear imaging studies of dopamine and psychosis, um, Amphetamine-induced dopamine release is um, increased in patients who are acutely psychotic, and the amount of dopamine release correlates with the uh, increase in psychotic symptoms noted after an amphetamine administration. Um, Meta-analysis have showed increased presynaptic dopaminergic capacity, which is an index of dopamine release in patients with schizophrenia, and we also see increased dopamine release in patients at risk um, of, a, of a psychosis where their um, dopamine release is somewhere in between controls and patients with schizophrenia. Uh, 
Um, in contrast, there's really a meta-analysis of dopamine transport availability have showed no significant change in dopamine transport availability. So this led us to hypothesize that amphetamine is associated with a greater risk of psychosis than methylphenidate because the changes induced by dopamine more closely parallel what's been observed in schizophrenia. So to conduct this study, we used real-world evidence using administrative insurance claims databases. Um, whenever a prescription is filled at a pharmacy, an electronic claim is generated um, that has very detailed information on dose, what drug, um, quantity dispensed, frequency of prescribing. Um, and this is considered the gold standard for measurement, measurement of drug exposure. In addition, whenever uh, someone with insurance goes to the doctor, the doctor um, bills for their visit and uses um, ICD-9 or ICD-10 diagnosis codes. Um, so we have information on diagnosis, the dates of the visit, what type of visit was it, was it inpatient, outpatient. We also have uh, procedure codes, um, and all of this medical information is linked to the pharmacy claims data by the person's member ID. So to, for this study, we used two um, insurance claims data. One is Optum Clinformatics, which is actually United Healthcare, and then we also use Market Scan, which is a a database that has um, data on commercial employer-based insurance plans, and we used an incident user active comparator design. So to be eligible to be in our cohort, you had to be between 13 and 25, have at least one outpatient ADHD encounter, no prior use of amphetamine or methylphenidate in the past year because we wanted to study new users. And you had to have continuous enrollment in the insurance plan and continuous prescription drug coverage during the preceding year. Um, we excluded patients with any prior psychosis, and you can see these are a list of the psychosis codes that we excluded. We also excluded anyone with a previous diagnosis of bipolar, any antipsychotic or mood stabilizer use in the preceding year, anyone with central nervous disease or narcolepsy or other stimulants not typically used for ADHD. And one of the surprising things that I learned from doing this study is that methamphetamine is actually an FDA-approved drug for the treatment of ADHD, but fortunately is rarely used. Um, we also excluded patients who use steroids within the past 60 days because of the known risk of precipitating mania and psychosis. Um, so for methylphenidate, we included patients taking methylphenidate or dexmethylphenidate, which is an antimer of methylphenidate. For amphetamine, we included patients taking mixed amphetamine salts dextroamphetamine, or list dexamphetamine, which is a prodrug of dextroamphetamine. Now, at the time of the study, the clinical guidelines for ADHD suggest that methylphenidate and amphetamine have similar effect sizes for the treatment of ADHD, with no specific pre preference for using one over the other in this age group. Um, so after applying the inclusion-exclusion criteria, we were left with about 330,000 patients. We used a method called, called propensity score matching that I'll describe on the next slide, where we actually have one-to-one -one matching of patients in each database. So there's one patient on methylphenidate matched to one patient on amphetamine group. And so our total sample size was about 110,000 patients per group. So an overview of the study design, there was a one-year washout period uh, before starting a stimulant where we applied, um, we measured covariance to control for. Um, the cohort entry date was the date of the first prescription claim for amphetamine or methylphenidate. We started follow-up seven days after they started the drug, um, and we followed them up until either they had a psycho psychotic episode, the end of initial exposure, crossed over to the use of the other stimulant, death, the end of enrollment or in the insurance plan or end of the study period. And when someone stopped the drug, we actually applied an exposure risk window of 60 days, which means that any psychotic event that occurred within 60 days of the last prescription counted before they were censored from the study. So our pre-specified primary analysis was we used propensity score matching. You basically create a model where instead of looking at the outcome, you actually try to predict assignment of the drug. So you basically are predicting what is the probability this person with this set of covariates or confounders 
will be treated with amphetamine or methylphenidate. And then uh, you match patients in a one-to-one -one ratio so that each patient um, taking amphetamine is matched to a person with um, methylphenidate using this probability score. And this actually works as good as randomization for uh, balancing uh, measured confounders between the two groups. But unlike randomization, it, we cannot uh, balance for unmeasured confounders. And then we use survival analysis uh, for time to event. Um, and we actually used a meta-analysis to pool results across the two databases. And that was our pre-specified primary analysis. Um, we used a, a large group of covariates for propensity score matching, uh, demographic factors, what type of insurance plan did you have. Um, we used uh, markers of ADHD severity, including um, visit utilization, oppositional conduct disorder. Um, did you use another type of non-stimulant? Um, and also asthma, because asthma is associated with an increased severity of ADHD. We also looked at overall healthcare utilization, psychiatric medications, um, a variety of psychiatric diagnoses, as well as uh, many measures of substance abuse, including um, utilization for substance abuse treatment um, and various uh, use disorders. For the outcome of psychosis, we did performed an external validation study. We actually used partners' healthcare data um, the research patient data registry. We selected one, uh, we basically looked at 2,718 patients who um, met similar inclusion, exclusion criteria and followed them until the, until the end of their available data until they had a psychotic event. So there were 65 patients with an ICD-9 or ICD-10 code for psychosis, but we found that by reviewing their notes only 20 24 of the 65 patients were not psychotic. But if we added an antipsychotic medication to a psychosis code, the positive predictive value increased to 93%. Um, to make sure this uh, measure of psychosis was validated in our, the data used for the study, we actually reviewed the claims profiles for all of the patients who developed psychosis. Um, and we did this blinded to stimulant group. We found that um, 91, the positive predictive value in our data was 91%, um, and the proportion of patients who probably did not have psychosis were more common in the methylphenidate group, so our results were, if anything, biased towards the null. The most common reason for false positive was really typos. Sometimes you have a patient, for example, who had a series of 296.3 codes, which is actually moderate depression, and you would see a single 295.3 in the middle, which is paranoid schizophrenia. So one of the interesting findings from the study was actually the stimulant prescribing trends. We found that the older you are, the more likely it is that you will be prescribed amphetamine. So a patient who is 13 years old will have about a 50-50 chance of being prescribed either of the two stimulants. But by the time you're 25, um, it's very unlikely that you will be started on methylphenidate. And this is new users who haven't used stimulants before. We also found that the use of stimulants was increased over the study period, in particular the amphetamines. Um, this actually is, shows the number of patients, but if we actually um, look at the uh, number of patients divided by the total number of patients entering the insurance plan per year, we actually see that the rate of amphetamine use increases consistently through uh, 2018, which is the last data that I've looked through. And uh, if we look at this geographically, um, if you look at this, these maps, if blue represents less than 50% of the, actually blue represents more than half of the people are started on methylphenidate, whereas red represents more than half on amphetamine, with the darker colors indicating even greater preference for that stimulant. And you can see at the beginning of the study period, most of the country started patients on methylphenidate. Um, and by the end of the study period, uh, we see a dramatic shift where uh, most states are starting people on amphetamine when they're diagnosed with ADHD, uh, especially notable in the South. And so after propensity score matching, I'm just going to show a subset of the uh, covariates in our model. Um, the patients were very well matched on basically all the factors that we measured. Um, 
you can see that uh, depression uh, within the preceding year and use of antidepressants was fairly common. Um, prescription opioid use was also found in 14% of the patients. Um, and one thing to point out is that substance abuse is poorly measured. Uh, you can see, like, for example, cannabis use disorder is found in about 1% or 1.5%, which is highly unlikely that that's the rate of cannabis use disorder in 13 to 25-year-olds. So the results, um, after propensity score matching, we found an increased risk of psychosis with amphetamines in both of the databases independently with a pooled risk ratio, hazard ratio of 1.65, uh, representing a 65% increased risk of psychosis if you're started on amphetamine compared to methylphenidate. Um, when we used more stringent definitions of psychosis, such as one inpatient or two outpatient diagnoses plus an antipsychotic medication, the uh, ratios were even higher. And uh, if you look at this graph on the um, the right axis is the number of psychotic episodes, and you can see that the number of psychotic episodes per year closely paralleled the prescribing of amphetamines. So the psychotic episodes were rare, uh, according to our definition. Um, so psychotic episodes requiring treatment um, and a medical encounter with antipsychotic medication occurred in only 106 patients started on methylphenidate versus 237 in the propensity score match sample. Um, but one thing to point out is that the, the follow-up time was pretty short for the study. It was only four to five months on average because we uh, censored patients after they stopped the stimulant, which was the most common cause of leaving the cohort. So really, I think this study best represents the short-term risk of psychosis uh, shortly after someone has started on a stimulant and doesn't really represent long-term risk. Um, because we used a definition that required a treatment with antipsychotic, we found that most of the um, psychotic episodes were hospitalizations, um, where 77% of the patients who had psychosis treated with amphetamine um, were hospitalized as compared to 62%. Um, and when we actually looked at the incidence um, of psychosis compared to the general population matched on age, gender, and year, you can see that the incidence is higher for methylphenidate and amphetamines. Um, the previous studies have shown that ADHD itself is associated with an increased risk of psychosis, so we cannot really establish whether methylphenidate increases the risk of psychosis or whether it's ADHD itself. So um, in this data, most of the stimulants are actually pre prescribed by general practitioners. Um, you can see that uh, the preference for amphetamine is highest in family practitioners as compared to pediatricians. Um, psychiatrists also tend, tend to start people in this age group on amphetamines as well. And one of the interesting findings is that when we looked at subgroup analysis by provider type, we actually found that the risk of increased psychosis with amphetamines was greatest um, in the non-psychiatrist. And this could be for several reasons. It might be that psychiatrists are better able to detect uh, symptoms of hypomania or prodromal symptoms that might lead them to not prescribe a stimulant or to preferentially prescribe methylphenidate, which is perceived as a less potent medication. Also, um, family, family doctors tend to see their patients less often. Um, because uh, stimulants are Schedule II medications, you need a new prescription every month, but you don't have to see the patient according to DEA regulations uh, until 90 days since your first. So sometimes providers will write multiple prescriptions for a patient and date them forward by a month. Um, so if you're seeing your patients less often, you might not detect uh, subtle symptoms that might indicate someone is developing mania or psychosis um, until it's too late and they need to be treated or even hospitalized. Um, so this is an observational study. It's not a randomized controlled trial. So we really, it's difficult to establish causality. Um, but what we can do is do sensitivity analyses to rule out alternative explanations. For example, one possibility is that patients prescribed amphetamines had more severe psychiatric comorbidity than patients prescribed methylphenidate that wasn't captured by our data. 
So to address this, we did a negative control analysis where we looked at um, emergent visits for depression without psychotic features, and there was no difference between the two stimulant groups. Another possibility is that patients prescribed amphetamines might have had a greater severity of ADHD. Um, it could be that patients who were, may have had cognitive deficits leading to the treatment, and maybe if you had uh, cognitive deficits related to prodrome, you might be preferentially treated by, with amphetamines. And if that was the case, no matter how far after stopping the drug, you would still expect to, expect to see greater psychosis in the amphetamine group, um, because if it's just related to unmeasured confounders, greater severity, that would suggest it's not related to the stimulant. So what we did was we modified the exposure risk window. So as you can see, just to remind you again, the exposure risk window is the time after stopping stimulant um, where we counted the psychotic event. So if we, as you can see, the pattern that we show is that the further out from stopping the stimulant, the lower the effect size is, which suggests that um, it wasn't just related to differences between the two treatment groups. And this pattern of decreasing effect sizes the further you are out from stopping the stimulant is consistent with attributing the events to, to the actual stimulant use. We also conducted an analysis where we compared patients that um, were diagnosed with ADHD but were never treated with stimulants. Um, I'm a little bit cautious about this analysis because we observed some confounding by contraindication. It seemed that the patients who were not treated with stimulants had much higher rates of substance use disorders and they had more psychiatric comorbidity. Um, and also the propensity score matching did not work as well. But nonetheless, um, we still find a similar pattern where the risk of psychosis was greater comparing amphetamine patients to those with ADHD who do not use stimulants than methylphenidate. Um, another possibility is um, patients prescribed amphetamines may be more likely to be abusing their drugs compared to methylphenidate. Um, it could be that they were abusing other substances like marijuana, uh, alcohol, cannabis, so we actually performed a series of negative control analyses where we looked at substance use disorders as the outcome instead of psychosis. So we looked at substance use disorders overall, alcohol use, cannabis use, opioid use disorders. And for all of these analyses, we found no significant um, increase in the risk of substance abuse for amphetamines compared to methylphenidate. We also performed a bias analysis uh, using data from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health they estimate that cannabis use in patients in this age range is uh, about 13%. Patients with ADHD have almost a threefold increased risk of cannabis use. Um, so using this data, we estimated that the prevalence of cannabis use in the methylphenidate users was 36%. Um, then using data from a meta-analysis on the increased risk of psychosis with cannabis use, um, we found that the prevalence use of cannabis use in amphetamine users would have to be 97% to fully explain our findings, as compared to 36% in the methylphenidate users, which seems highly unlikely. Another possibility is patients were abusing their amphetamines more, and so it's actually the abuse of the stimulant that led to the increase in psychosis. And there's actually a, a large number of studies uh, in college students showing that immediate release amphetamines are the most commonly diverted and abused drugs, um, most in patients who are not prescribed them. So there's a higher market demand for immediate release stimulants. Um, and also studies have found that the rates of stimulant misuse and abuse are more, are common, more common in college students than younger adolescents. So if we found that greater abuse or misuse of amphetamines was driving our effect, we would expect to see a greater effect size in college-age students and also in those prescribed immediate release amphetamines. Well, we actually found the opposite. We found that the effect size was highest in, higher in the pre-college younger students or patients. And we also found that the effect size was lower when you compared immediate release amphetamines to methylphenidate than comparing extended release or the prodrug of amphetamine to methylphenidate. And so my interpretation of this is that it's very likely that 
Some of the immediate release amphetamines are, are, have higher rates of diversion than the methylphenidate um, in the college students. So diversion of the amphetamines may have partially masked the effect in the older age group. So the strengths of the study is that it has a large sample size. We found consistent findings in the two healthcare databases. Um, we used an incident user active comparator design, which is less prone to bias. We used propensity score matching to balance confounders between the two groups. Um, we validated our outcome measure and we conducted a range of sensitivity analyses that consistently supported the conclusions of our primary analysis. Um, we did, the limitations include that it is an observational study. We lacked detailed data on the patients um, in this data source. Um, and we also did not have any information on race or ethnicity, family history of psychiatric disorders, or, and substance use was underreported, and all of these things could contribute to our findings. So a lot of people have asked me what should be the, the effect on clinical practice. Um, the findings really require replication in a data source that has more detailed data on patients. Um, but given that the events are rare, I think um, we need to really identify risk factors that confer an additional risk. So we can sort of identify the group most at risk of having psychosis without denying treatment to those who are at low risk. Um, ADHD itself is associated with significant impairments in function. Uh, people have poor academic performance. They're more likely to get into car accidents. So it's important to treat patients. Um, and a recent network and meta-analysis of randomized control trials and stimulants um, based on efficacy and tolerability, they found they recommended methylphenidate to be used in adolescents, but they did find that amphetamines were more effective and tolerable in adults. Um, this meta-analysis was, was based on short-term study of a few weeks, um, and there really is a paucity of long-term data. But on the other side, it's a rare event in the, in the setting of a common exposure. Since millions of patients in the United States are currently prescribed amphetamines, and the risk identified in this study really translates to thousands of patients potentially being conferred undue risk of psychosis, uh, especially in light of the fact that an alternative an effective option is available. And if we actually look at stimulant prescribing practices in different countries, um, you can see in this study they found that um, the prevalence of stimulant use is much higher in the United States compared to especially European countries. Um, it's almost 7% in Medicaid, which overrepresents children and adolescents. And it's uh, much higher in one of the data sources we used in this study, market scan, compared to other countries. And what stimulants are people using in these other countries? Um, when I reviewed the literature, it's really other countries are predominantly using methylphenidate. Um, in, in some Asian countries like Hong Kong and Taiwan, only methylphenidate and anamoxetine are licensed for treatment of ADHD. In Japan, using prescription amphetamines is illegal. And in uh, European countries, um, methylphenidate was used preferentially and amphetamines are rarely used. Um, in contrast to the United States where amphetamine use is common and growing, and it's the only country that, to my knowledge, where amphetamines are used more than methylphenidate in some age groups. Um, another question of interest is the use of stimulants in bipolar disorder. There was a study published in the American Journal of Psychiatry a couple years ago when they found that methylphenidate increased the risk of mania in patients with bipolar disorder who are currently not on, on mood stabilizers. But if you were on a mood stabilizer, you did not have an increased risk of mania. There's no data on the treatment emergent risk of mania in bipolar disorder with amphetamine use. And so that's something we're going to be looking, looking at in our future work. Um, and when I, I looked at the rates of uh, use, there was a six-fold increase in the use of amphetamines in patients with bipolar between 2004 and 2016. So future directions, um, because the psychotic events are rare, we want to identify the subgroups of patients most at risk or identify prescribing practices and, that are risky, um, looking at patient characteristics and electronic medical records, 
and uh, also looking at high-risk use, such as patients taking high doses of drugs. So thank you very much, and uh, you can email questions, if any arise, to the uh, email that was provided. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moran. Um, so for those of you who don't know the email, so education at mclean.harvard.edu. If you want to type in questions to Dr. Moran, you can do so right now, education at mclean.harvard.edu. I also want to remind people that if you're, if you're uh, live streaming from home and you want to get continuing education certificates, um, the text code for today's uh, um, talk is 484. So you want to um, punch that into your Cloud CME account through text message, 484. Um, so while we're waiting for questions, I have some questions for you, Dr. Moran. Um, uh, so clearly there, you, you know, you've, the data that you presented and certainly data from other sources throughout the United States suggests that amphetamine use has skyrocketed over the last 20 years. Um, we are prescribing um, stimulants across the board, including methylphenidate, but amphetamines, as you um, kind of highlighted, have taken over even methylphenidate prescriptions. Yes, and I also looked at data for adults up to the age of 64, and we see the same pattern, especially in like 30 to 49-year-olds, we're seeing a very sharp rise in amphetamine use. And the methylphenidate use in older patients is very low. And so one of, you kind of hinted at this and suggested that you're going to be looking at this, but given the, the clear overlap between psychotic symptoms and bipolar disorder and some data from other sources that suggest a tremendous increase in the rate of bipolar disorder in the U.S. population. So in adults, I think it was, I think the years were something like 96 to 2007. In adults, rates were up 85%. And in children and adolescents, they were up 40-fold, so 4,000% increase. Yeah. And, you know, most people think of bipolar disorder as a biologically-based disorder, probably genetically based. Um, and we don't have mutations in the gene pool in such short order over a 10-year period to result in a 40-fold increase in a diagnosis. And do you think that this increase in stimulant prescription use might be related to the concomitant increase in bipolar disorder diagnosis? Um, I'm not sure about that because this, the risk of uh, was pretty rare in our study. We did include bipolar disorder with psychotic features. Um, there isn't really a great valid measure of mania, and so we're actually going to be doing that in the future as part of our looking at bipolar disorder. I, I know that um, Ezra Guvenek and I actually uh, recently wrote an editorial for JAMA Psychiatry, and it seems that the high increased risk of bipolar disorder in uh, children is mostly due to uh, the concept that has arisen in some places that um, you can see chronic irritability without an episodic nature in children is kind of considered to be a sign of pediatric bipolar disorder, so I think it's more related to differences in working definitions of mania or hypomania in children, because that uh, seems more likely to be explaining the 40-fold increase that you see in children. Um, and adults, uh, you know, I think that people are kind of recognizing bipolar due to disorder, which was introduced more recently in history as well. Um, so I think there, there could be an increase in, in bipolar disorder potentially due to stimulants, but I don't think it's explaining that the large drastic numbers that you just described. Great. So um, one of the questions that's coming in over email is, what are your thoughts on the use of amphetamines um, or stimulants more generally in people with substance use disorders? Um, yes, I mean, I think uh, that's a common question. I think one thing to consider is that uh, these drugs are, do have an addictive potential, um, so there's no reason to, so I think some doctors shy away from using stimulants because they are addictive and you don't want to put somebody on an addictive substance. 
Um, there are studies, though, suggesting that if you're started on stimulants earlier in life, that actually might be protective against developing a substance use disorder. So I don't think there's really enough evidence. Um, I have personally seen patients um, who were, had opioid use disorders and were treated with Suboxone, for example, who were started on stimulants and developed psychosis, um, and partially in part to the fact that they started overusing the stimulants. Um, so I, I don't think there's, it's something you have to think about very carefully, about where the person is in their treatment. Great. Um, one of the other questions is um, related to the, the confound with all kind of mental disorders, that having any mental disorder confers higher risk for having yet another mental disorder. Mm -hmm. And that's been borne out um, over the last several years. There was an article in the American Journal of Psychiatry suggesting that there's a P factor, that there's some kind of common risk for mental disorders in general. Um, and, and so I think the confound in any study like this, like, like you've done, is that you're working with a population of people already diagnosed with ADHD. And so how many people, you know, and a, a common conundrum in the, in the psychiatry community is how often is our ADHD symptoms in childhood kind of a precursor to what we call bipolar disorder. Um, and so one, of, one question um, that comes to mind is um, looking at the patients who discontinue stimulant use but following them in the subsequent years because they were diagnosed with ADHD but mm -hmm. then chose to stop the treatment for whatever reason and following them because presumably they would still have the same biological risk because they have already been diagnosed with the disorder um, they just chose to stop the specific treatment for it and comparing them to those who continue on stimulants um, to see if there's a difference in rate of psychosis, for instance, or bipolar disorder or anything else. Right. And did, have you looked at that? Have you thought about that? I know um, I haven't done this like systematically, but I have sort of looked at when I was doing the uh, partner study. Um, the rates of bipolar disorder, if you just look at somebody who's been on stimulants, regardless of what stimulant group, like long term, is, is higher than what we're reporting in this study. So I think ADHD is a risk factor. I mean, and there's actually what was a study done uh, in Taiwan where they looked at uh, methylphenidate versus uh, no treatment in patients with ADHD, and they found the strongest predictor of psychosis was the diagnosis of ADHD. And they found a slightly higher risk of psychosis in the patients treated with methylphenidate but it, it was small in effect size compared to the risk of ADHD itself. And great. So at this point, I think seeing no more questions, I think we're gonna go ahead and end early. So I wanna thank you very much, Dr. Moran, for sharing these like really interesting and fascinating findings with our audience. Very much, and if you have any questions, uh, that arise, please feel free to email me. My email is right on the screen. Thank you.